Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. First, let me uh, reintroduce myself. Uh, in recent times, and I think um, this is, might be new, I have changed my role at Career Services, and I'm no longer a manager of industry advising. I am now what we call an employer engagement consultant. And so what that means in my role is that I engage external stakeholders, such as employers, in the industries of media, arts, design, sports and rec, hospitality and tourism, and tech and engineering. So I see some of my employer connections here in this room. Please follow up with me. And what I do is I support them in the recruitment efforts at George Mason. So if you're in any of those industries that I spoke of, uh, I'm that go-to person. But also in my office, we have other employer engagement consultants in different industries like government and law, um, health and science and all and the like. So uh, that's that's our role. And, and so it's basically the same thing as what I was as an industry advisor, except now, instead of having student facing responsibilities and employer relations, I'm solely employer relations to make sure that I can dedicate and allocate my time uh, appropriately to the needs. Because as we saw with the Mason video, uh, not only is uh, the students needs growing in this area, but we have a large, large uh, infrastructure of employers in this area with a lot of uh, needs, particularly tech and engineering. Uh, I, I cannot say that without, uh, uh, in my time of switching to this role has been heavily tech and engineering, but I wanna help all the different industries and all of them make sure that they get connected with great talent. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, just give me a thumbs up in the chat if you see my screen as the presentation screen. Okay, great. And let me make sure I move some things over so I can see. There you go. Um, so this presentation, am I a leader? What type of leader are you? Um, and so obviously we're going to be discussing the different types of leadership during this pre presentation. I believe that we're all leaders, but, you know, it is what, you know. Uh, a very interesting topic and something that is really near and dear to my heart because it's actually connected to my journey in leadership, as I now can say with confidence, I am a leader. You know, I, I don't think I used to be able to say that very confidently, but as I've developed in my profession, I do feel like I'm a leader. So that's me. Uh, my name is Philip Holgerson. If you're watching this video yet later, please still use a QR code. I encourage you to use a QR code. I love to get to know people. I got a QR code called uh, New Friend Survey. I just like meeting new people and connecting and building relationships. Uh, not only am I a higher ed professional, I'm a host of my own podcast, which is Positive Filter, which we talk about in mind, well-being, positivity, uh, growth in regards to careers, families, all those things, as well as I'm an aspiring public speaker. Uh, you know, that's why I'm really excited for this opportunity to be a part of the Mason Speakers series, because that's, you know, one of my goals is to be a public speaker, get out there and really share what I have. So I'm on the list of public speakers and I'm actually an avid Toastmasters for those that are not familiar. I'm a Toastmasters, which is a public uh, speaking nonprofit organization where people can hone their skills in speaking. And, and this is where it kind of ties into this topic. So I just want to throw out a little something again. I need some interaction here. I need, this is not one of those passive talks. I want to engage with you. So if you're watching this later, you know, you can write this down on a piece of paper. But right now I want to see y'all, you can either use uh, your browser and type in there, or you can actually use the QR code. But I want to know, do you believe you're a leader? Please share with me. Let me know. Please don't be shy. I mean, I know we got like 10 people in here. So I, I hope to see at least eight, eight response in here. <laughs> Eight respondents. And then if for those watching it later, you know, keep it on paper. But I want to see what do you believe you're a leader? Yes. Okay. One person. Thank you. Not, uh, not alone. Let's see it. Any other one? Other people? Not sure. Two. Keep it coming. You can put it in the chat too if you want. You know, I know some people are not uh, as they might have some things going on. But do you believe you're a leader? Let's do. We got two people. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. You're using the chat. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, we have a lot of people here that believe they're leaders. That is great. That is great. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I would be honest. When I, if you were to ask me that question, okay, next one. Sorry. Oops. What do you think are the characteristics of a leader? Put that in the chat as well, or you can put it in the thing. What do you think? What What are the characteristics of a leader? Just words, associations, anything that comes to mind. There's no right or wrong answer. When you think of the word leader, what do you think of? What adjectives, what actions, what descriptors, characteristics of a leader? And you can put that in the chat as well. Uh, great engagement for those later. 
when you're doing this, if you're watching this video later, strong, I love it. If you're watching this video later, have a notepad or a piece of paper, write it down. I want you to really put all these thoughts on paper, transparent. I love it. Others focus. I think I like that. Good listener, emotionally intelligent. Excellent. Uh, available, inspiring, ethical, um, knowledgeable, motivating. These are all great words. Greg, he's a leader. He put his name in there. I love it. He's a leader too from the library branch. Um, so let's do this. So listener. So thank you so much. As we move on, uh, re relationship focus. These are all great. These are all actually correct. These are all correct answers. But I want to share with you. This is my journey. When I was growing up, this was the people that I thought of as leaders. So as you can see on the very end is my father, Colonel Philip Linwood Wilkerson Jr., where I get my good namesake. And when I was growing up, this, yeah, this little handsome little man right here with the, the Gumby fade, that was me. And so as I grew up, I had envisioned that a leader, a leader was a strong man like my father. A leader was in front. A leader uh, spoke. When he spoke, the world, the, the room listened without uh, questioning. Uh, when I looked at my father, they, they took command. Uh, they were very authoritative, very disciplined. Uh, my father just, he made his bed regardless. Even when he was retired, he just had discipline. He was sharp. He was well-spoken. He was strong. Uh, his voice just, like his voice was so deep. I don't know, how, I think my voice is not the same. Uh, he was my model. And so as I grew up and shaped it, um, I was like, well, I'm not like my father in different ways, right? I do respect my father, but I'm not as disciplined. Or maybe I'm not that like you know I don't like to get in front and tell people what to do as much. Um, I'm not as you know strict, right? And so does that make me less of a leader? And that was my my shape, right? My the the shaping of leadership was through my father. And then you see this other handsome gentleman. This is my grandfather on my mom's side, my my mom's father, Doctor Charles James. And so as I grew up with my grandfather, uh, understanding looking at him as a leader. He was a black doctor, early black doctor in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so he, even in the adversity of systemic racism, was able to accomplish so much. He was a doctor. He was an MD. So in my mind, leadership was that intellectual prowess, right? Um, that achieving to be a doctor. Wow, that's crazy. Um, additionally, he was probably one of the most charismatic, funny just witty people I knew. And so I was like, okay, maybe I have a little bit more like my grandfather, but I'm not a doctor. Uh, honestly, if I see blood, I get, I faint. I, I just can't do it. I cannot go to the hospital. Uh, that's just not my thing, right? And also STEM wasn't my thing. I wasn't really in academic pursuits thinking that I want to do science, you know, right? That wasn't my thing. I loved history and I loved writing and being creative. So I had these two models of people I looked up to and they shaped me and said, wow, well, while I took some aspects of them, I'm not like them. So maybe I'm not a leader because they're the leaders. They're, they're leaders in my mind. And so what really transformed for me in this journey of looking up to people and respecting them was that when I joined Toastmasters, we had to do a project. And in that project, we had to learn about the different types of leadership and then do a presentation on it, which I'm doing for you right now. And as I investigated that, and as we did the training, as I learned about the different types of leadership, I was opened up and said, wow, there is no one size fit all to being a leader. There's no one size fit all or style to being a leader. There is many different styles. And so early on, I hope that all y'all could say yes. And hopefully at the end of this presentation, I want you to be able to say yes with confidence. You are a leader too. And then additionally, all those characteristics that you wrote, they were all correct in some form or aspect because maybe someone that you looked up to as a leader exhibited something like that. So this is just an example. Um, as I was doing my Toastmasters training, they wanted to break it up into uh, one, two, three, six, eight. I had to do quick math, eight categories. And so these are not the end all be all. These are not the only pillars and styles of leadership, but they were just the way that they wanted to organize it in a train about the different styles of leader. And so we're going to go through it, bureaucratic, uh, authority, uh, authoritative, innovative, pace setting, democratic, uh, affiliative, coaching, and altruistic, right? And they're, and they're all different types. We're going to have some examples, and then we're going to see how that 
aligns with you as an individual? Where do you fall into that? So the first one, bureaucratic. This is literally the one I like to use. It says, do as I say, uh, and not as I do, just do as I say, right? And so what we have here is more of that parental relationship where it strictly is it's, it's one way, right? A parent says, hold my hand when you cross the street. There is no why, no dialogue. No, you hold their hand when you cross the street because in that mindset, this person has your best interest at heart. They have more experience and it's very hierarchical. It's, it's absolute. And so we have a lot of uh, spaces. There's a lot of spaces where being a bureaucratic leader is applicable, right? Uh, think about this. I used to think about this and we'll get to another slide, but it kind of intersects with the next one that we'll go to with being in the military is that when a person of high command tells you to do something, particularly in a situation that's dangerous, you do it without question because it's dangerous, right? So if you're in combat, you listen to that bureaucratic leader because it's a there's no if you don't, there could be dangerous repercussions. You can actually lose your life or get seriously injured. So there is spaces where being a bureaucratic leader makes sense. But as like as there's positives and pros, there's cons, right? The con is sometimes people become resentful of that bureaucratic leader. They don't feel heard. Uh, it's micromanaged. Um, it's, it doesn't work for all, right? I think they say right here in this slide, it's most effective in short-term, immediate decision-making, crossing the street, you know, dangerous situations. And so think about that in your mindset of that leadership. Authoritative. Now, similar, I think it really intersects a lot. As I hear, have here with this picture, have General Patton, and this is a long-term goal-oriented, but it's still hierarchical, right? This leader inspires through the, the, the mission focus, right? But their mission is to hit this objective with authority, you listen. There's a clear hierarchical right here. There's clear definitions and there's clear standards. So the military, I think is also a great example is that there should be clear direction and there is a set standard of excellence, right? And it, it goes from, how you walk, to how you talk, to how you dress, right? That is a standard that is set, it's systemic and it's long-term. When you are a Naval officer or you're in the military, you're buttoned down. I remember my dad used to say like, when I was a kid, used to make sure that my buttons aligned with my belt loop and it was clean and crisp when my bed was made. I joke with my wife, my wife's like, Philip, you still make your bed correct. Like no one's here, but my dad taught me how to make a bed. I could bounce a quarter off of it. And that was the set standard of that authoritative leader, right? Um, and so, as you can see, this, this is really good for a long term. So bu bureaucratic earlier, maybe for immediate dangerous situations, this is a more so long term systemic cultural uh, end goals, right? Um, and usually in this style, as you rise up in the hierarchy, it is assumed that this leader, ha this leader has more experience than those that, and knowledge than those that lead. So General Patton clearly has more experience and knowledge than the colonels and the people underneath him, right? There, there is an assumption there that is pretty much true in a, as you rise up in that set standard. Innovative. So how many people right here, you could throw in the chat or just do your name. How many people have heard of the, the term thought leaders, right? So as they think about it, uh, they're leading, they have a vision, but they also still collaborate and it's very futuristic and they love ideas and generating ideas right and this person as a thought leader is still in this collaborative collection of gathering thoughts maybe they have the vision but they need a panel they need people around them to innovate right and so we think right here the good example here is steve jobs right steve jobs he's a leader he was a thought leader he uh was innovative with apple but he didn't do it alone. He kind of he, he had a, a collection, of, a, a council around him soliciting ideas. And he was just the driving force. He was maybe the face. Uh, you know, when he go to the conference with his, with his um, was that turtleneck and, and jean style, right? He was out there. He was in the front. But those weren't all his only. I, he wasn't the only one that had the ideas. He was collaborative, right? And so um, this is really good for like risk takers, right? You know, those thought leaders, they're very futuristic. Um, and they like to solve complex problems. Like what, what are we doing for the world? Like connecting the world with technology. Uh, but as you can see, right, it's kind of sometimes it's not as strict or standardized 
as a bureaucratic or authoritative leader, right? But that innovative thinker. And so there's a space and there's a style for that. Pace setting. So I like to use for this one is, as it says, right? You set the tone. Uh, think about this as a track coach. Uh, you know how to push people just enough to get them to be excellence, but you know how to take your foot off the gas. And so I used to remember, I used to run track and I now really align with the pace setting one, right? So when we had practice, my coach would be on the stop, so he'd be on the sideline, you know, like when we were doing the 400, so the 400 meter. And as I ran the 400 at every 100 mark, he'd be like, split, he would tell you your splits. And so he was trying to tell you, keep it, keep it up, keep it up. And then, you know, he was setting the tone. He was set, he was a leader, but he was focusing on uh, productivity, you know, getting the most, optimizing your talents. Um, I think a lot of this, the pace setting uh, leader, mostly aligns with a lot of project management, right? You have these milestones, these benchmarks, and you're keeping people on pace. Now, the positive thing is that, uh, what do you think about, if someone said, keep your foot on the gas too long, what happens? They burn out. So this style of leadership is not really great for long-term, right? You just, you kind of set in tones, you have, like a, as a project manager, you kind of know the opt, but you know that this is not something that could sustain, especially, uh, something that's really intense. Like if you have a really intense project that you know that you can't just put your foot on the gas for people for years and years without burning them out. So you have to be mindful, mindful of pace, benchmarking, um, that optics of productivity, uh, but it's, um, it's not sustainable very long. And this is also very, in regards to pace setting, this is a, a, as a leader for a pace setter, it has a lot of autonomy that you have to trust that the people on your team are motivated themselves and highly skilled, right? So as a track coach or any kind of coach that's like training someone else, they have to assume that they're not going to micromanage and tell people how to do their task. They just want to make sure that the task is done predict with productivity, but they have to have to assume that the people that are doing it, you know, I'm not going to hover on them. I have to be, uh, they have some form of autonomy, right? Like they are taking some of the agency. They're motivated to get it done. Uh, they're motivated to be the tr best track athlete themselves or they bought into this project. Um, so, you know, they don't have to always, and two, I like one of the things too, they don't have to feel like they have to over communicate, right? With a lot of details and instructions, they kind of set the pace and they allow people to do it their own way. Um, and so that's one style of leadership, pace setting. Whoops. Uh, democratic, uh, you know, we got, uh, was it, uh, Robin Maxine, uh, I reclaim my time. And so obviously this is what we think of when you're a leader, but you're a leader that represents, um, constituents, right? Uh, politics or any board or anything where you're voted in, you are the leader, but you were leading because you were voted in and you speak on behalf of a group of people. And so obviously it closely aligns with politics but there's politics and everything, right? So think of anything, school boards, um, all these organizations where you are the leader, but you still have to engage the constituents. You still have to speak on the behalf of others. You're not making decisions just because you are. You're making decisions on, a, on the collective best, uh, best of a group, right? A consensus in decision-making. Um, and so uh, this is ineffective when you don't have a lot of time. I think uh, we always say, right, politics takes time. You know, when you are on those, making those decisions on the behalf of constituents, they make they may want you to make decisions immediately, but you have to realize that there's a processes, voting policies, that even if you are speaking on behalf of the constituents, that sometimes the vote doesn't go your way. So this is, you know, that's, that's a lot leadership. That's kind of the leadership style when it's ineffective, but at the same time, it's collaborative. You're solving problems together. Uh, overall, people should be working together uh, to speak on the best behalf of others. Um, and this leader just, you know, they're, they're motivated by providing opportunity through participation. Like I need people to get involved. I need to hear from people to be the best, you know, obviously politician or whatever. I need to hear from my people to make sure I'm representing you appropriately. Collaboration and communication is key for this leadership style. Uh, uh, affiliative, this one is to create, I, I have the Dalai Lama, you know, the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, up here. Uh, they want to create harmony. Um, they like to collaborate, emotional needs. Uh, they navigate, they want to make sure that they uh, mediate 
uh, create positive relationships to avoid conflict. But sometimes conflict is good, but, you know, they really want to avoid conflict. And they really, they're really focusing on increasing morale, repairing broken trust, and working through stressful situations. And I think I just got the Dalai Lama for that. Uh, coaching, the coaching relationship, very similar to pace setting. I got my one of my favorite coaches, uh, Dean Smith. I'm going to tell a quick story about why I love Dean Smith. Well, one, I love North Carolina. So sorry for all the Duke fans here. But uh, it's mostly like the coaching aspect is a leader developed leaders, right? They, you don't act to have to actually do the task to tell someone how to be better. You take people where they are. But you also just care about them and you want them to grow as people like beyond whatever that is. And so one of the things I love about Dean Smith is that he wanted to grow. He said on flight, I know I'm a coach for basketball, but I also want to be a coach for men. I want to be a coach for better leaders. And so when he died, he had actually put money in a trust. And when he passed away out of his trust, every player that was a varsity letter player underneath him received $200 and a note that said, thank you so much for your time in my life. Please take your wife or family or whoever, your partner out to dinner. And so literally every player got a letter in the mail and a check for $200 for dinner. And it didn't matter if that person was Michael Jordan or James Worthy or was someone that was a walk-on, uh, they all got $200. And I thought that was the coolest story ever, right? But this person really focuses on motivating the individual to challenges. You know, they're just so positive. Um, they reaffirm that person's personal gratification, right? They're really motivating. They're a coach, right? And a coach, the difference is between a coach and like someone that dictates is that they allow, the people still have agency in this, right? A coach can't go into court and play for you. You know, the coach can pull out the best he can on you, but at the end of the day, you have to, you know, put in the work and do that. But they just, they really want to um, be effective through um, a positive culture and creating morale. But the same thing about being a coach is that, think about this as a leader, it's, it's short term, you know, season reasons and seasons, right? Eventually that coaching relationship changes. They don't, they move on to another team or they retire. Um, this is not permanent, right? You're just trying to bring out the most excellent uh, thing in that individual one-on-one -on -one or a team for that period of time, whether it's a season or a couple seasons. So knowing, and then I forgot altruistic, think of, uh, I, I need to keep a slide though, but for altruistic, someone put in there servant leader, you are really serving the people. Mostly altruistic is through the mindset of serving others, serving the community. And while doing so, maybe you have a little bit of, um, not say leader, but organizing people. So if you work for you know, a nonprofit or a volunteer role and you're actually volunteering, the part that turns it into a servant leader is that when you corral the other volunteers and people learn from you by your example. So kind of going here, ranking in order, what is your number one, uh, number one leadership style? And then what are some other ones? And you can put it in the chat as well, or those writing it down. After you heard about this, let me also let me just also repeat what is yours in order, but everyone, and this is the part that dawned on me, everyone has some form of this type of leadership. And all we're intersectional, right? We're not one typecasted, one box. We're not just bureaucratic leaders or this. We are intersectional. So in the bureaucrat, I am a bureaucratic leader because I have two boys. And I tell them, I'm doing, you don't have to question me right now. Put your seatbelt on, right? That's true. But also I'm a coach. I'm a mentor. So I have these one-on-one -on -one mentor relationships. I like to believe I am a thought leader and I like to collaborate and get ideas. So which one, I love it. Which one is your preference or ranking but we're all of them. Wow, we have a lot of demo, you know, democratic leaders in coaching, right? Motivators of others. This is great. I love it. Thank you so much for participating. Um, we're going to go, and I'm going to go to the next slide real quick. And just keep it on a piece of paper, because I want to leave some for questions and Q&A. So which one I gravitated to the most? Now, as I think about it, I did this slide a couple years ago, right when I first came out and did Toastmasters. At that moment, at that moment, I think that most of my leadership style was altruistic because I was doing things in the community. I was serving my fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the NWCP. So a lot of my leadership wasn't really on the job or 
I thought thought leadership. In that space, it was me doing a lot of volunteer work and being people organizing a corralling around me. So for me, I think my style was more geared toward altruistic. This I, I do better serving others. I'm a servant leader. Um, I like to empower people. I like to actively listen, use empathy. I think I get that from my counseling. And so what came out to me, these are my scores when we took an assessment that honestly, I'm a little bit all of these, right? As you can see, you know, the lowest one, right? I told you, it's not like my dad. This is my dad. I'm not that, right? This is my track coach. This is, you know, the thought leaders, but these were the ones, harmony, working with people or that mentorship. I'm an intersection of all of them, right? That's the type of leader I am. And this is my team at Career Services, right? I love them. We were working together. I love just my, my. this is a while ago, back in 2019. I, I don't even remember this picture so long. It's pre-pandemic, but that was, this is when I was doing this. This is when I took this assessment you know, that's when I was growing. And through 2019 now, I now can firmly say with confidence, I am a leader. I'm a different type of leader. I have more examples now um, of my leadership journey. So in conclusion, we are all leaders in some form or fashion. We are all leaders. I love this quote. Leadership is not about being the best. Leadership is about making everyone else better. I'm also going to share with you in the chat, I didn't get a chance, but recently I wrote an article for the school newspaper about my journey as a leader and that that notion that when I looked up to my father and my grandfather and all the people in my family, it did change my perception of leadership. And I had to do a lot of unpacking and unworking to do in my own um, through, you know, through the, the dialogue that I had that, you know, and this article, I called it I Too in Black History because that was always my thing growing up. Like, I'm not going to be historic. I'm not going to create a legacy like my father and my grandfather. But as I work through this and process through this, um, and I, I'm just going to go to the tease at the very end, one of the lines I said was, I've had an opportunity to change the lives of many students, kind of like that Dean Smith. And so one of the things I always think about about creating legacy is that in the book of life for others, if I'm one sentence in your story, I'm satisfied. So let me repeat. In the book of your life, if I get one shout out, one sentence, somewhere in chapter five, chapter two, I feel like I have made a legacy. I have created something that goes beyond me. And thus, I too am, what I, in this sense, Black history, because I was doing it, for, I was meeting my mentorship for Black students, right? So I've contributed to that, to that world. And so I hope that this, uh, thing empowered you, please feel free to connect with me. Uh, I also wrote an article about mentorship. You know, I think that's really important to me. I wrote that actually with my mentor about mentorship can uh, exist across identities and how that's important, you know, to have mentors and coaches and leaders that are diverse of different identities because that helps you grow as a leader. And so I'm really open to questions. That was the end of my formal presentation, but I'm open to questions and